G'day everyone. My name is Peter Green. I am a Baptist minister, uh, now retired. I was a pastor for over 35 years and um, when I retired, I, uh, that happened at the same time as COVID struck and so I found myself with a congregation that wasn't able to go to church, didn't have anyone to go to, so I found myself doing Zoom meetings and then turning it over to uh, a Facebook uh, movie of my talks and now I've decided to open a YouTube channel as well so that it can be more widely available. Uh, I hear from a number of people from around the world that they enjoy listening to what I have to say and so I hope that the things that I say today as well will be encouraging and enlightening to you. So without further ado, let's get on with today's talk. Hi, today is the 4th of July and uh, our topic today is Radburn Revival and Community. The passage is found in the first epistle of John, uh, chapter 4 and verses 7 to 12. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Radburn Revival and Community You may know that I'm a retired pastor, but 40 years ago, I was a council town planner and we planners used to say 50% of what you plan will be subverted by politicians and 50% won't happen in your lifetime, but you can enjoy the rest. There was a lot I liked about planning. In my course, I particularly liked urban design. And one thing that we looked at was how planning can help or hinder the formation of community. We briefly reviewed Sydney's Minto and Claymore because of the Radburn style layout. In the Radburn layout, houses face open space and the roads give rear access. In theory, roads divide but parks unite. Radburn design aimed to help people interact and know each other. It aims to create community. And most town planners are concerned to get people living together harmoniously. Most want to create community and many think of medieval villages built around a marketplace or village green. They wish the interactions of those places could happen everywhere. One of our lecturers warned us against romantic notions of medieval life. He said medieval life was nasty, brutish and short. You don't want that back. Some Radburn villages worked out, most didn't. You need a particular kind of person in the settlement to make it work. What bothered me as a town planner was that you can't create community just by making the physical conditions for community. If you filled an exact replica of, say, Annick in Northumberland or Rostock in North Germany with people, would that make a community? It takes people determined to create community to make community happen. But I understand that town planners or architects who want to create community are doing exactly what God wants. We are created for community and God built, built us for community. In Psalm 133, we're told how good it is when brothers live in unity. Unity and community are related concepts. In Ephesians chapter 1, we read, 
With all wisdom and understanding, God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good purpose, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfilment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. It goes back to that creation principle in Genesis chapter 2, where God says, it is not good for man to be alone. The most basic community is two human beings sharing their lives. Here are two stories about the formation of community. In 1987, 18 month old Jessica McClure fell into a tube well in her aunt's yard. She jammed about seven metres down with one foot over her head. The world watched while for 56 hours, people from across the United States united to rescue the little girl. They came with different ideas and with different skills and equipment that they thought might help. They couldn't just drag her out. They couldn't widen the well because they would cover her with rocks and dirt. Eventually they drilled a second shaft and dug under her and pulled her to safety through a cross shaft. Everyone came together with one goal, to rescue Jessica. And they did. But they had to not only have a common goal, they had to agree on what they were going to do, on who would make the final decisions, on who would take what role. They were of one mind and purpose in getting that little girl out of the well. And that's what a community is like. My second story began around the beginning of, happened around the beginning of the 18th century. After Hussite Protestants were defeated in one of the early battles of the Thirty Years' War, Moravia came under the control of the Habsburg emperors, who were Catholic, and for 100 years the Moravian Hussites suffered intense persecution. Some persecuted Moravians entered Eastern Germany and in 1722 settled on the estates of Graf Nikolaus von Zinzendorf, a young Christian nobleman. Soon German Lutheran pietists and people who just didn't fit anywhere else joined them too and formed a sizable Christian community at a place they called Herrenhut, which means the Lord's Protection. But they were disunited. They were Protestants, but you know how hard it is even to get two Baptists to agree. These refugees had different backgrounds and they were constantly squabbling. Zinzendorf told their pastors to preach Christ, to focus on the cross and Christ's sufferings. He told them they needed to find unity in the one who'd done so much for them. They spent months in prayer and intercession. On the 13th of August 1727, five years after the first refugees arrived, the different groups met together in the Bertelsdorf village church for communion and revival broke out. As someone said, they learned to love one another. They didn't stop there. They learned to love their Lord and they started a prayer meeting which continued day and night for over a hundred years and they learnt to love the world. It was Moravian missionaries who first confronted John Wesley with the question whether he had the witness of the Holy Spirit and was a child of God. They encouraged him to preach, Christ, preach faith until he had faith. They were an explosive missionary movement which later inspired William Carey the Baptist who systematised and structured the kinds of things the Moravians had been doing for 175 years. Christians often think of revival as being some movement which changes the world without the effort of evangelism. They think that drunkenness, drug taking, abortion, single motherhood, swearing, whatever, will all stop and people will become moral, that all the difficult things in society will come to an end. I was praying one day as I drove that someone I had a tense relationship with would be converted and it came to me so clearly that it was almost like someone hearing someone in the car with me. You are praying selfishly for that person because you want an easier life. Are you a Christian who wants revival so you will have an easier life? 
or live in a less confronting society? If so, that's selfish. Revival is primarily about the formation of community. Revival is a psychosocial transformation. That is, it changes the social groups we belong to and the thinking of the people within it. And this implies that the environment is only marginal to the real substance of a revival. A Radburn, a Radburn type development will probably work well if it is the home to a transformed, transformed group of people, but it can't make that transformation happen. And the experience many of us have is that it actually works against community. But many of you are probably concerned that I have talked about a psychosocial transformation. Surely I should be talking about a spiritual transformation. Here's where we often go wrong in our quest for revival. We look for a spiritual transformation, which is the end goal, when we should look for a psychosocial uh, transformation, which is how we get to the desired end. So we begin with a, per, with a group of people desiring revival, and we want them to become a revived group with a clear, clear love for God, for each other, and for the world around them. And the process of getting from one to the other has three steps, which are often not recognised. The, these are catalysis, chaos, and brokenness. There has to be a catalyst for change, a catalyst which provokes the process through chaos and brokenness. The catalyst may take many forms. Let's assume we're talking about a church. The catalyst may be failure to thrive, failure to achieve the goals it knows it could achieve. People are not being converted. There are subtle conflicts or whatever. Or the catalyst may be someone who comes in and speaks or acts in such a way that the group is confronted and sees its need to change. Or some disaster may strike and the people realise they can't continue as they've been going. I was in a beach mission team in the 1960s and one year we had almost no results. Previously, after a few days, people responded to the gospel or renewed their commitment to Christ or at least took literature. But this year, after 10 days, nothing. That was our crisis. The catalyst was Terry Logan. He outlined to the team where we were going wrong, relationship issues, people speaking and acting in ways that didn't glorify Christ. And he said, we must repent. Some of the people argued, said things weren't so bad. Others said that the evidence was clear, no one was responding. Eventually we all gave in. We accepted the evaluation, we repented, we told God we were sorry, we professed a desire to change. There was no overwhelming sense of God's presence or speaking in tongues or falling down. We knew that something had changed and the evidence was that in our final three days of mission, we saw more people professing faith in Christ than we had seen in any 10 days of mission in the previous four years. Whenever people face the need for change, they will react in one of several ways. They'll run away from it, they'll ignore it, they'll fight it, or they'll accept it. And in a church, you'll probably find all of these things happening at once, and it's chaotic. Human beings are troop animals. We live in clusters. We need each other. We like to see what the others are going to do. And we feel anxious and unsettled when other people don't know what they're going to do. You saw this kind of thing happen when Jesus preached. In John's Gospel, we hear several times that people drove him out of the synagogues and wanted to stone him or on one occasion to throw him off a cliff. Paul and his companions were often beaten or stoned or imprisoned when they preached the gospel. So were John and Charles Wesley. Charles Grandison Finney was threatened with violence when he preached too. Often this time of chaos is too painful and people withdraw into comfortable distance. Distance from Christ, from each other and from their world. But when they're brave enough to keep going, no matter how frightening or unpleasant the the situation, then there's hope. When they keep going, brokenness comes. 
As I said, this is a psychosocial process. Individuals abandon their objections and resistance. The group stops struggling and accepts the situation. And this is the same process whether it is people coming together to dig a little girl out of a well or coming together to dig the world out of its grave. It's at the point of brokenness that a Christian group can unify around Christ and his purposes. Transformation begins. The ancient Israelites were broken on Mount Carmel when Elijah demonstrated the power of the Lord and they cried out, Yahweh, the Lord, he is God. It's what Jesus says to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. You have forsaken, forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So if we want revival in our churches, we have to be prepared to go through that kind of process. Fiddling at the edges may help create the conditions, but until we're prepared to acknowledge our failure, despite the chaos and pain it causes, and become broken so that Jesus can truly be Lord, we will never have true revival. But when we are revived, we will love God, we'll love each other, and we will love our world. Let's seek revival with all our heart and never let go until the Lord blesses us. Amen.